My name is Ed Frawley, and today I'm with uh, my friend Kevin Sheldahl. Uh, Kevin is a retired canine handler on the Sheriff's Department down in New Mexico, and he is a police dog instructing judge, an international judge, and he runs a police dog school twice a year, six week classes for new law enforcement canine handlers. The name of his company is Canine Services. Kevin and I just finished and we've done uh, police courses for almost 20 years. We just released a course titled Muzzle Fighting for Police Service Dog. We did that course, we did that as a video back in 2005. Here it's 2021, 16 years later, and we updated it with a lot of new information. We did another podcast on that that you can refer back to. We'll put, the, we'll put the link to it somewhere in the cloud, but I'm keeping it a secret right now because I don't know where it should go. But today we're going to talk about the course that Kevin and I have really talked about doing for, I don't know how many years, since the late 1990s on scent detection. And the approach we're gonna take uh, is how we approach selection testing dogs. And the odors that we're gonna use, we're not doing a course on narcotics detection. We're not doing a course on uh, explosive detection or the civilian, uh, the civilian dog sport of, uh, what do you want to call it? Nose work is a copyrighted trademark, but there's four or five different civilian dog sports. What we're doing is, why don't, well, why don't you go ahead and explain it? Well, um, over the years, uh, set specific odor detection, scent detection, detector dog work, whatever you choose to call it, on the practical side of the, uh, the fence, has really grown. Uh, there are more dogs doing some type of scent detection in the United States than any other um, professional dog. Uh, and this course is an evolution of what we've, what we've learned. And it also is a course that's designed to show the way that I integrate it into the dog classes that I teach. Um, there's always the difficulty of how much can you get done in how much time. And uh, this is a very rapid, but strongly built uh, program. And it focuses on what we would call a primary reward system. And that is very natural for a dog, just like uh, a hunting dog, it's natural for them to, to wa want to flush game or point, um, at point game and we utilize those natural, um, those intrinsic behaviors, some people like to call them instincts, that uh, we select for in, in, a, in a group of dogs, and we apply them to try to get the best that we possibly can for a dog to hunt, alert, and indicate uh, on whatever substances that uh, we happen to need to assign to that dog. One of the things that I, that I already mentioned is Kevin runs uh, these handler schools, six-week handler schools. Uh, the interesting thing is that in the past 20 years, he's run over 65 six-week courses, which kind of speaks for himself and his experience in not only odor detection, but in, in training dogs for law enforcement. And it's been an evolution. He and I have been friends since we were trying to figure it out yesterday, whether it was 1982 or 1983. And uh, it's amazing how far things have come. And then the interesting thing about this odor detection course is it doesn't matter whether you're using bed bugs or narcotics or gunpowder or explosives. It just doesn't matter the type of dogs that you need to have, at least in law enforcement, can do all of them. But it's a good point. Why don't you talk a little bit about the difference between some of the civilian, and there's four or five different organizations that do scent detection work, but dogs can do 
scent detection work that could never do law enforcement work. Oh, absolutely. The reason why is, like any dog sport, you have to have a set of rules. And those rules include the environments that you're going to be working, the type of fines that you're going to be working. So it's all prescribed. You may not know exactly where the find is at, but you know what you have in front of you. And that is completely untrue of practical detection. Yeah, you never really know. There's, and, the, and the environment is always changing. There's never two calls that are the same. There's never two deployments that are the same in, uh, in, a, in practical application. So whether or not you're doing human remains detection, um, whether or not you're doing um, narcotics, or you're working in a corrections environment, everything changes. And so what we have to have is a robust system that develops a, a, an intensity level in the uh, work that comes from high levels of prey drive and high levels of hunt drive. Uh, and in addition, if we can have high levels of play drive, that's excellent as well. Um, these things are important that we select for that right dog and then we develop them in all kinds of environments and so that we can get the dog to generalize to any place. And unlike any dog sport, any dog sport, we, have, uh, we do not have a defined set of rules. We don't know that you're going to do three cars today. You're going to do an area of 12 feet by 12 feet with X number of items in it. Um, and this isn't meant to disparage the sports at all. I love dog sports. I do dog sports. Uh, but it's something that we have to understand as we develop foundations and as we select dogs. Uh, so this, this thing starts off, this course starts off with a selection testing process. Um, and, you know, it's not new. Um, I have a few twists that we've looked at over the years. Um, many of the dogs I do are multi-purpose dogs, and this is also designed for those multi-purpose dogs. Uh, whether that multi-purpose is a dog that tracks and does detection, or it does patrol work and does detection, or it does search and rescue and does detection. Um, when we're working hard to get things done in a... We have to be concerned in the professional area about how long it takes us to get things done. I cannot have a handler without a defined end. I have to say, we're starting here and we're ending here. And uh, so these, some of the techniques are designed to get us to that point. It's grounded in some old stuff, but we've really put a lot of new twists. You'll, you'll learn about um, marker training in the class. You'll learn about uh, drives and character traits in the class, which other people may translate to intrinsic behaviors, or others may call them instincts. Um, but there are things that we have to selection test for on the population of dogs that will do this. And we'll, we'll get all those things put in there. And we're gonna really work on foundations in this class, because the stronger your foundation, then your life will be smoother as you go further down the line in, your, in a career. And so the foundations become extremely important. Um, hundreds of repet rep repetitions that cement the dog's behaviors um, in, in the odor that's assigned to them. Hundreds of them. And that helps us to have a dog who has a reflective, reflexive uh, response to the assigned odors. And not one that has to take a lot of time to think about it. And so, well, as we move what, on. Well, one of the things, and I'm going to back up here a little bit, between the, the uh, civilian dog sports, which I think are great, Kevin thinks are great, they're just a great way to work with a dog. But there is a bit of a confusion with some people that think that some of these civilian dogs, that you're doing the same thing that dogs that are trained for law enforcement do. And I guess maybe the simplest way to dumb it down or to give, a, to give an explanation or example of the difference is that in another life for 10 years, I ran a narcotics dog and a tracking dog. And I don't know how many times I was on the interstate 
where I got called out to search for a vehicle or we were doing a search warrant uh, in a drug house where it was nasty, nasty, nasty. And the truth is the dogs that are doing, a lot of the dogs that are doing the civilian work could never do that. And it's because of their temperament. It's just not strong enough. But those same dogs can be very, very successful and have a lot of success in their dog sport because it's a defined search area. So we're, we're talking about doing a course, really, the civilians can benefit from it, but it's really directed towards... It's directed towards the professional um, or the, I don't wanna exclude the volunteer that also commits to doing things like search and rescue work and the human remains thing that's become very popular amongst search and rescue people. But the person who, who needs to be able to apply this in a practical environment, uh, that's where we're gonna address it. And the entire course is designed to get people onto the street functioning. Um, and so the course is designed to get people through that foundation. And then in the, in, within the professional uh, arena, there has to be a third party um, certification process. So shortly after the class, they would present themselves to a evaluation of some type. And those evaluations, there's many different organizations. I'm, I, I'm a member of several. Um, there are some states have state style certifications that, that are developed for certain dogs. Um, and our goal is to make sure that that's a starting place for these dog teams. And so they would go from a class, usually I give, a, give them, a, it's a kind of a pressure cooker course, the way I, I run this thing. And so I like to give them to give a couple of weeks rest, um, you know, just lighten up a little bit for a few days and then go to a certification. And it's interesting that um, I've kind of kept track and I've only had two dogs in the last 15 years not manage to obtain their certifications on their first attempt. So and it's a strong program. I think yesterday we were talking, how many dogs do you think you've trained for, just for the state of Wisconsin? I, well, somewhere over 250, but you know. So there you go. Yeah, um, that are up in, up in this part of the country. And I have a lot of dogs in, in New Mexico where I'm from and um, a lot of dogs in Arizona and, some, and a spattering out through other states around. Um, and, and those dogs range from dogs doing human, human remains detection to narcotics dogs, although, you know, pretty much we're eliminating marijuana. Politics have changed things lately. Um, and many dogs have just recently been retired because they do marijuana. Um, and then do bomb dogs after 9-11, I only did, a, did one here and one there. But, and then after 9-11, um, boy, that skyrocketed. Um, corrections dogs, which uh, um, do other things, they often will find prescription drugs like Suboxone, uh, which is a treatment for uh, um, opioid addiction. And, but it's very easy to smuggle into uh, prisons. And uh, so it's very popular. Uh, we train for that. We train for some of the other opioids. Maybe we're training them for, uh, for a few other things as well. Um, most prisons, paper money is illegal. Within, within it's considered contraband. And we'll teach them to find paper money. Um, one of the hallmarks of this course that we teach is what some of the, old, some of the people who translated from German some of the earlier detection stuff, they called it conflicting the dog. It's kind of a, a difficult word to use. Um, we do a lot of proofing and we do it in a prophylactic manner. So early on, the dogs are exposed to diversions and distractions that could uh, upset them. And I don't mean upset by mentally upset. I mean, upset the system um, and cause problems for them. We do a lot of proofing before they even realize they're being proofed uh, in the course. Diversion and distractions become a hallmark of the process that we do. And we've set it up so that it's not difficult for the dog 
and we don't have to go through a process of letting the dog fail and going through problems with the dog and, and, and repairing problems and backfilling the holes we created. We get all that taken care of out at the front end. Uh, and that's a big part of the course. So just to repeat what you said a little while ago about these different certifications and organizations. So the dogs, the course isn't going to be designed just for, say, your certification. These dogs can be trained for mm -hmm. any certification well, if, they have their, I don't, if they have their foundation down, correct? Yeah, I don't have a Kevin Sheldahl certification. Yeah. I utilize a, uh, um, the, uh, a certification that was originally seen in, in, uh, in Germany and uh, modified a slight bit here in the United States um, that some people will recognize as uh, PSP. Uh, PSP is a series of tests, and they're, t they're designed to test different aspects of police dog work. And so uh, PSP2 would be narcotics. PSP3 would be explosives. PSP1 is actually a patrol dog. And so I utilize those standards with, when I'm testing dogs. Or I'm also happen to be a, and I'm not going to promote one organization or another, I'm a uh, certifying official in another organization. And so often we sponsor those events, whether I'm, whether I'm involved in it or not, it doesn't matter. I bring in other people to do it. But all these other organizations have somewhat different twists on the way to do a certification. And uh, the, the PSP one is really the hallmark is diversions and distractions in every single practical scenario-based search um, where let's say uh, an NDDA is, a, is an identification process. Can you identify drugs in, a, in, a, in an arena? You know, you know exactly what you're gonna be doing and it's just about identification. So everybody's got a different twist, but the thing that's, that, that this test, that this course is designed to conquer all of those tests, not just one of them. So the way we're kind of putting it together is I've been collecting footage with Kevin for, on this, <laughs> seems like for 20 years. I mean, we're going to use some selection testing tests that we did 15 years ago here at Learburn, down in our training field that I still have, but we've also collected footage over the years and in about, where are we? Five weeks, you're gonna start your next six week course. Yeah. And then I'll go down to Albuquerque, uh, probably for the last couple of weeks, and we'll recreate the foundation for the course with the dogs that are going through. So we can see some step by step by step methods on how we put this together. It's the same exact thing that we did with uh, our muzzle fighting. The muzzle fighting course that we did back in 2005, when I redid it in, uh, here in 2021, all new material. We're lucky enough to be able to use some of the old selection testing and video that we filmed. And we'll put it all together. And of course, they had, in the muzzle fighting course, we had 88 videos. My guess is we're going to have way more than that in this older course. I think course. we'll probably be quite a bit over that. I think so, too. And, and the reason why is, is we want people to see the small steps, not just the big steps. And uh, so that's gonna, there's gonna be a lot of small videos added so you can see what we're doing. Um, there's some kind of behind the scenes things that happens um, with the dogs. And we're gonna talk a little bit about um, drive development and where, where, we, where we develop drive, why we do certain things that we do. Uh, and we'll try to have video examples of some of that stuff. Um, one of the reasons I think I have some really good success in my course is I prep dogs. And uh, the, the preparation, uh, creating a little bit of possessiveness with the dog, making the dog uh, um, understand that, hey, there's this game that we play that's for him to hunt and, and, and grab a prey item. If I get that done beforehand, it's, it's helpful. And uh, that makes the course go a little bit faster. And we'll show what dogs look like when they're doing that. Um, I found, I also do civilian dog sport. And it's include, you know, IGP, American Schutzland. Um, actually, I'm here at Learburg because we're doing a, a Mondio ring 
uh, seminar here that I'm attending. And what I find among people that come from that background is sometimes they haven't freed their dogs up enough to do this stuff independently of them. And we have to, we're going to talk in this course about why we have to teach the dog to work independently and how we have to make sure that we prevent ourselves from influencing our dogs. It is a big thing these days about, uh, and you're going to learn about something called Clever Hans, which was a horse, and uh, how we're attacked by the information about Clever Hans and multiple experiment, ex experimentation that has demonstrated some things that we have to be aware of in the professional end of this thing. It doesn't matter in the sports end of things at all. It's just a question of, did you do it or did you not? Now there's a question of, you know, on the professional side of this thing, it is, how did you do it? And did the dog really do it? And we have to address that. So we'll close this out. And maybe what we should do is, when we're done with this course, we'll sit down and do another video. Oh, absolutely. Okay. It'll Great. be fun. Very cool.